I'm Harry. I'm the Rough Sleeping Pathway Coordinator. Um, I'm Peter Murphy. I'm the Rough Sleeping Program Manager. Could you tell me a bit about your role? Uh, yeah, my role as the uh, program manager is uh, my job is to contract manage an array of commissioned services, uh, all relating to rough sleeping. Uh, these services are funded via the government's RSI grant scheme, uh, the RSAP and NSAT schemes as well, which are another government's uh, stream of funding. And these were set up from April 21 to they're going to run out in April 2025. How many are currently rough sleeping in Exeter? Um, average nightly figures hover around the mid-teens currently, but this can move up and down depending on factors like uh, the seasons, the weather, etc. Um, I'll give you an example. Single night figures, say, back in 2020, were around 27 per night, uh, people rough sleeping in Exeter. Currently, we average around 15, so we've almost half that number in the last four years. Um, more data, the highest recorded number in the last four years was 35, and that was in September of 2020 this year in February we had it down as low as five. Wow and how does that compare to the rest of the country or other areas? Well na nationally rough sleeping went up to 27 percent but in Exeter it's only gone up by four percent. Um, it's, it's gone up we accept that but we are bucking the, the national trend the, the, although you have to look at the um, it's normally around seven boroughs in London and large cities like Manchester and Birmingham that up that amount um, but in the southwest region alone Exeter only makes up less than two percent of all rough sleepers so we do accept there's been a small increase but as I said we, we're bucking the national trend. And how do you get to that number? Uh, we get our number via the outreach team who go out tirelessly six days a week in all, in all weathers and complete welfare checks and ultimately head counts for the clients. Uh, we also utilise our intelligent-led services. For example, we've got a local charity, St Petrox, who provide um, showers, food, etc. And what we do is we compare their footfall numbers to the numbers of our known cohorts. Um, we have to accept that not everybody who accesses their services, St Petrox, may be actually rough sleeping. They may be, for instance, sofa surfing or just have you know some sort of um, tenuous way of living. Um, so at least we, from that, our outreach team have a very strong awareness of who's out there. And this awareness means we can confidently get support to our most vulnerable clients. Michael? What else do the outreach team do? Uh, the outreach team are experts in their field and they understand and, and emphasize uh, and uh, understand the sort of complexities of what happens and how they can engage with the clients and see what they can do to support them for a life away from the streets um, having a housing pathway is really is is their main purpose but sometimes it's not quite as simple as that and in most cases that's actually the, the most difficult path is Clients are, in, you know, entrenched in a, in a street-attached life. Um, outreach speaks to the clients and try and unlock, you know, sometimes a very, very shut door. Um, but they'll try and help them with information and services that provide food and drug and alcohol treatments, uh, mental health support, uh, internet access, even clothing and bedding. Uh, they also complete targeted health outreaches with the local GPs and nurses going out and sometimes treating the clients directly on the street if necessary. Does the council support rough sleepers in any other way? Uh, yeah, we, we've got an absolute array of uh, services solely dedicated to, to rough sleepers and, and they're the contracts that I manage. For example, we have caseworkers who work at the CoLab um, who help pay for health, uh, we help pay for health services like uh, the nurses at the clock tower surgery. We employ a team of psychologists, drug and alcohol and mental health services. Uh, we commission contracts to help find clients who share have their expertise to better understand rough sleepers that what we call our lived experience clients uh, as well uh, we commission uh, for uh, employment skills education training um, plus we have contracts for things like security and even specialist cleaning services as well um, last we have a team of what we call navigators who are who have, have specialist skills in criminal justice health substance abuse who, who dedicate their time to really really complex clients and, the, and they who may have an array of competing issues, again, mental health, drug and alcohol dependency, they may be ex-offenders, or just and help them to find a way for a client to, to be able to leave the street and not return. So my day job ensures that all these contracts work for all our clients. What are some of the main challenges when it comes to rough seeping? There's 
a, a huge list of them. The, the main challenges are obviously their health risks, their exposure to elements, um, their shortened life expectancy. Uh, 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 Rough sleeping man is expected to make his mid forties. Uh, poor nutrition, poor hygiene, uh, chronic illnesses, lack of medical care. You know, again, mental illnesses and substance issues, etc. Then there's their safety side of it: the harassment, violence, lack of security, lack of privacy. Um, again, social isolation, stigma, uh, discrimination, um, stress and trauma. All these, are, um, all these are barriers. And then there's other secondary barriers like employment, uh, criminalisation. People, uh, you know, concerned about loitering, begging, camping in public places. Um, and then there's the sort of the, the the big ticket side of that, which is lack of affordable housing and uh, even even loss of their possessions as well. Uh, it's a, it's a complex issue that can result from a, a combination of systemic factors, personal circumstances, and broader societal challenges as well. Addressing these challenges requires coordinated efforts from across multiple sectors, including housing, health care, social services, and even law enforcement. Do you have any recent success stories that you'd like to share? I can give you two briefly. We've got uh, Prospects, which is our new uh, assessment centre that's been open since April. Um, these are the clients. The clients come directly from the streets to the assessment centre. It gives them an opportunity for a, a period of stabilisation and for us to understand their needs as well. Um, we've recently had two clients moving onto their own uh, accommodation, their own flats, so and they've been in, in Prospects for one for about six weeks and one for about three months. So that's a been a really excellent transition through the through the tiers for that um, and also we have the emergency sleeping pods which are situated in Howe Road car park we've had them for about three years and, and that we've managed to help around 60 clients over that three-year period into uh, into some stabilization and, and many don't ever return to rough sleeping from even from that that start what is your favorite thing about your role um, for me, it's the perspective I have. I'm not someone who works front line, so w what that means is I get to step back and look at what, what's happening with clients. I don't. I know their names, I know their backgrounds. I won't, wouldn't necessarily recognise them on the street because I don't, that isn't what I do. So what I'm able to do is give them a, some um, fair, equitable treatment and just make sure they're all receiving the same level of high service that we'd expect. Perfect. Thank you. You're very welcome.